<laughs> Jesus. Just a little comedy. Wayne's World. I grew up near, on or about the rough parts of Scarborough in the uh, suburbs of Toronto. And uh, it's very heavy metal. And I was a heavy metal kid. This character was just basically everybody I knew who talked that way, including myself. Okay, we're just about out of time, right? But before we go, we'd like to take a moment here for a Wayne's World salute to the guest jeans girl, Claudia Schiffer. Swing, swing, tentpole. <laughs> She's a babe. I had done Wayne Campbell on Canadian TV. Um, I, first of all, I had done it on stage in punk clubs. And then I got on Second City main stage in Toronto and did a sketch. And then there was a show called It's Only Rock and Roll on Canadian television, and I did Wayne's Power Minute, and then I got hired for Saturday Night Live. The, he was in my trunk of characters. Then Lauren said, do you want to make a movie? He offered me a different movie, and me being a dummy and not knowing anything just went, no, I want to do Wayne as a movie. And I was like, okay. We got behind it, we went to Paramount, and we made it, and we didn't think it was gonna get made, we didn't think it was gonna get released, and we didn't think that anybody would go see it, and uh, it was an unbelievable, unbelievable joyous surprise that it just kept being the number one movie for weeks after weeks. That bass player is a babe. She makes me feel kind of funny. Like when we used to climb the rope in gym class. I think one of the biggest leg ups I had was that I was in a film with Dana Carvey, who was one of the greatest comedians to ever be on Saturday Night Live. I just learned so much from him. I think the thing I learned the most because I'm a writer of the stuff, is that there's writing and then there's performing. And to enjoy the performing. He's the most joyful performer I've ever worked with. If I hadn't worked with Dana and learned that you have to get the fun molecules into the funnel that get onto the film, I don't think I could have done Austin Powers. It was just great to work with somebody that goes, yeah, we're supposed to show off. We're supposed to have fun. That's why they came here. Austin Powers, International Man of Mystery. So I grew up in Canada, but my parents, both of them were English, and uh, there's nobody more English than an Englishman who no longer lives in England. And my dad, who was very, very funny, and my biggest champion, loved comedy, loved comedians. He loved all entertainers. It was great that the one that he loved the most was Peter Sellers, who was English. When the Pink Panther was on, or even down amongst the Zed Men, more obscure, or the Bobo, or I'm All Right Jack, or the ultimate masterpiece of Peter Sellers, which is uh, Dr. Strangelove. We all aspire to that. We want to touch the hem of that garment. You know, I said to my dad, he goes, what do you want to do when you grow up? He was from Liverpool, and I said, uh, I know, I think I want to be an architect. He goes, why would you want to do that for? <laughs> be a comedian. So I had the opposite of what most people had. Okay, name, Austin Danger Powers. Sex? Yes, please. So for me, Austin Powers was that kind of cheeky chappy. It was everything that my dad was proud of, of being British. But another key ingredient of that was Burt Bacharach, and that there was a 60s that Burt Bacharach embodied that I hadn't really kind of seen put into the movies yet. The 60s that most people had done was Woodstock, Hippies, but the one that I loved was the moneyed 60s, the International Man of Mystery 60s. And I think the biggest influence was the movie Casino Royale. Thank you, and welcome to France, Monsieur Bond. I contacted Burt Bacharach, that was my first call, and he agreed to be part of it, and then he agreed to be in it. Then Elvis Costello agreed to be in it. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Burt Bacharach. What the world needs now is love. I was talking to my brothers, I talked to my brothers about seven times a day, and I said, I thought that you would have to have grown up in my house to like Austin Powers, because it was so specific, but it, again, it was such a lovely surprise that it meant something to other people other than just me and my brothers. Shrek. To me, it, <laughs> the Eurocentric form that is the fairy tale 
is really about classism. When I was approached to do Shrek, originally I did it as a Canadian and I re-recorded it as Scottish because that to me seems the most working class. But also too, I have a love of the Scottish people. I have Scottish ancestry and mostly English, but Liverpool is it's the pool of life between Scotland, England, and Ireland. Layers! Onions have layers. Ogres have layers. Onions have layers? You get it. We both have layers. <sighs> I love the idea of taking a fairy tale and turning it on its head and having it be that all the traditional bad guys are good guys and all the traditional good guys are bad guys. And I realized it's a dramatic role. I mean, halfway through I went, there's an emotional center here. You know, the old joke, I wouldn't want to be a member of a club that would have me as a member. I have always felt that way. The concept of going from a self-loathing ogre to a self-accepting ogre was meaningful to me. I love you. Really? Really, really. <laughs> You too. I, I love playing Shrek. If I had to do it one Shrek a year, I'd be thrilled. So I married an axe murderer. Every actor who's given a script is given an opportunity to, to shape it and give feedback. It was in San Francisco. I was like, if it's San Francisco, it should be beat poems and, and beat poetry. I love Jack Kerouac, and I would, in my life, would always be, there's no telling what's on the mind of the man going to the fire that is not there. You know, I dug Berlin Street, once white, now stained with gum. That sort of fun Kerouac thing. So I thought, well, I'll make him a beat poet in, in San Francisco. I wanted it to be a genre mix because, you know, there's a point in a man's life when he's deciding to get married and there is a part of them that feels that that makes them ever more closer to dying. As much as they're happy to be married, there is a, well, if I'm married, then it's kids, and if it's kids, then I'm retired, then I'm dead. And so there is a sense of one's own mortality at that moment. So I wanted it to, to uh, be a comedy thriller. Wait, throw I, why, don't, why don't you just taste it? It's got strawberries in it. You love strawberries. Taste it, taste it. I spent 20 minutes making it. Just take a sip. Take one no, little no, I'm sip. Just, gonna go. I'm just, gonna just go. try okay, it. One little go. sip. Wait, hurry. Take a... I am just so incredibly uh, grateful. I, I have to this day people saying to me, Heed, move. Heed, move. It's been a great surprising, fantastic experience that it's stayed around. It's a pentaverite. I've been obsessed with secret societies and I put into the script of So I Married an Axe Murderer that the Scottish father is obsessed with a group of people called the pentaverite who control everything. Well, it's a well-known fact, Sonny Jim, that there's a secret society of the five wealthiest people in the world known as the Pentaverite, mm. who run everything in the world, including the newspapers, and meet tri-annually at a secret country mansion in Colorado known as the Meadows. I've just seen the culture, since I did that a long time ago, get more and more into conspiracy theory. So I thought, well, let's bring back the Pentaverite, you know? Y'all just kidnapped a black man. We've been kidnapping white men for years. We want to give you an opportunity as well. Forget about him. Basically, we're the good guys. We want you to trust us. Why should I trust you, white man? Whiter man? Older whiter man? I don't know what the hell to make out of you. I was just sitting around and I thought, I grew up in a country where we like the government, it was just Canada, and we like experts, you know what I mean? And people who are experts are kind of taking a beating right now. But I thought, well, what if there was a secret society of five people? Uh, what if they were actually nice? And what if I played all five people? And what if I also played the guy who was exposing the uh, secret society? And what if he was a local journalist? Because I think local journalists are taking a beating as well. 
but I wanted it to be silly and fun and I wanted it to be cinematic and I wanted it to be a ride, a fun ride, like what I was hoping for with Austin Powers and with Wayne's World. I just thought that everyone's talking about this serious thing in a very serious way. Um, I would like to talk about this serious thing in a silly way and uh, do what I'd love to do, which is characters. The makeup man, Louis Zakarian, the same guy I'd worked with at Saturday Night Live, is a genius, made these fantastic character makeups for me. And I had a great, brilliant director in Tim Kirkby, who's English and eccentric, and was able to piece it all together. I just think that water will find its right level, and I think that once the people start to trust the experts again, and once the experts start to serve the people, and that's also including everybody, where it's all inclusive, I think we're gonna be okay. And I, I, I have to think that way too, because I have three kids under the age of 10. So I have to send out into the world that which I would want it to be.